Welcome to Story Comic Presents, where we interview amazing storytellers and artists. This is episode 210. I'm your host, Barney Smith, the storycomic.com, and we're excited to have with us the highly renowned and award winning Vermont author, Stephen Harris. Steve. Hey, it's great to be here. I really appreciate it and a chance to chat with you. It's going to be a lot of fun. Oh, I'm excited about it. Before we went live, we were talking about some of your other books that you published that had some um, World War I historical biographies. But I mean, we're also here to talk about your latest book, No Excuses, um, that just came out this past July, I believe, correct? Uh, yes. And so I'm excited to get into it and jump in and talk about this. And I know that you are an award-winning author. You've done a lot of historical biographies. For the sake of our audience, whether they be listening to this as a podcast or, or, or watching this online, can you give people a little bit of background how you got into writing? Well, I come from a family uh, of newspaper uh, people and writers. Uh, right. My grandfather uh, was the foreign editor of the old New York Herald. He started his newspaper career on the Kansas City Star with Ernest Hemingway, who was, you know, the, the 18-year-old lad. And my grandfather was, he was already married, but he was a few years older. And uh, his brother, my great uncle, was a one of the first reporters on the New York uh, Daily News. And my other great uncle, who was the... Uh, uh, brother of my grandmother. He was a cartoonist and a magazine illustrator. He also started out on the Kansas City Star. <laughs> he came to New York and he became an extraordinary magazine illustrator doing over 350 stories for the Saturday Evening Post. Collier, wow. And then Al Cap, who created Little Abner, said to him, you know, magazine uh, illustration is going to go the way of the dodo bird because photography, photography is coming in. He right. said, I, I've got an idea for a comic strip. Let's do a comic strip. So my uncle said, OK. So they created a comic strip called Abby and Slats. Great uncle, Rayburn Van Buren, he wrote it or drew it, and Al Cap wrote the continuity. And that lasted until uh, the, the late 80s. And then he retired. And... Uh, and my mother was a freelance writer, and my sister was one of the first women to work for Sports Illustrated. When it first came back, back in the 19, early, mid-50s, I, I happened to have the actual first uh, Sports Illustrated issue. Uh, when I was a little kid, I thought that was kind of neat. And so it was just in, in my blood. We'd sit around the dining room table. We'd talk about writers and writing. And, you know, I started uh, my newspaper career in a hometown newspaper, and and then I worked for a daily in, in Vermont. And, uh, and then I wound up, I got drafted and went to the Army in the 70s and 60s and got out. And then I got a job working for General Electric as the editor of their corporate magazine. That was a great job. Well, yeah, because you did mention, so you worked for the Burlington Free Press for a bit, correct? Yes, I did. I was in their Capitol Bureau in Montpelier, uh, you know, covering uh uh, state capitol and uh, seeing what was going on, what kind of shenanigans were happening with the legislators. And uh, that was kind of interesting. And I did that. And, uh, and then I went back down now from Connecticut. Then I went back down to Connecticut and I'd worked for my old newspaper again as an editor. Uh, they, it was a weekly newspaper in Reading. And I did that. And uh, then I came back to Vermont, worked with PR for Champlain College. And then I went back down to Connecticut, where I was the editor of uh, the General Electric corporate magazine, Monogram. And then I came back to Vermont, <laughs> where I started writing my books. Well, so I'm very curious, before we jump in, before we jump in and talk about the difference between, let's say, journalism and biography and, and, and then fiction, as, as someone who's been basically touching different genres of journalism over the span of about 40 years or so how has how has journalism evolved over the years well i think it's gotten worse it, <laughs> it, uh, you know reporters you went after the truth right and, and it, you, you if you found something that you, you wanted to prove something you had to make sure you had the facts were all there 
today I don't trust any news news person because you know they've they've got an agenda, and mm -hmm. whether you're a conservative or a, a liberal, they all have agendas now, and it gets to the point. I think I could be wrong that. Uh, what what are they trying to tell you? Are they telling you the truth? Are they trying to find the truth? I don't know. But even back in the old days, back at Yellow Journalism, it was like that today. You know, everybody was making up stories and doing things, and uh, the sensationalism was a thing. And, and I just feel like the old days, back in the you know the fifties and the sixties and the seventies, it was great. But I think maybe the Vietnam War started to change journalism. Uh, because mm -hmm. the country was so divided by those who uh, didn't want to go and those who went, those who, if they stayed in college or taught, they didn't, wouldn't get drafted. And, uh, uh, and all of a sudden, I think that you could start to see uh, a change, a slant of journalism, a, a, a little more, uh, not um, telling lies, but trying to force you to believe something uh, if they could find a way to do it and uh, be right. with be pro-war or anti-war. Right. And it's almost too like also with the advent of the 24 hour news cycle, it becomes more, like you said, sensationalism trying to get the viewership and the readership is. And the thing is, if you watch, if you watch television, whether whatever channel you watch, which is 24 hours of news, whether it's Fox, CNN or MSNBC, it's the same story for you start in the morning and they repeat it constantly, you know, and at the end of the day, I, your head is aching. I can't watch this anymore. So I watch Jeopardy. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about it too, like the level of say the um, attention of the readership. How have you seen that from when you were working, say from the eighties to the nineties as well? That's a good question. I, I, what's happening, I think is, you know, the print journalism, is kind of, it's, I think it's going to go away. And it's all going to be, you know, the cell phone and you're doing that kind of stuff, the ebooks, and you get that. And um, I'm an old, I'm an old timer. I, I like the feel of a book. I like the feel of a magazine. Uh, I haven't made the crossover yet to, uh, but I do have the cell phone, I will admit. I, I watch these people, they get so engrossed, but it's, and I'm looking at it, they're not reading anything, they're playing games. I still think people are still intently reading stuff, whether it's print or ebook or whatever it is. I, I don't think that's changed. At least I hope it hasn't. Right. And now do you see, so as you, how was the, the, the evolution that after you were became a journalist and then you started writing um, before we went on the air, we talked about a, a few of your books that you started doing some research back in the late nineties on some history of world war one. Correct. Yes. Yeah. And how how was the how was the writing process different for writing an actual book as compared to doing some journalism? Uh, that's a good question, but I don't think it's really that different. Okay, because you you've got to find the truth. One of the things that I when I was doing my research on my World War One books, one of the things I learned in my family was human interest. Everybody loves human interest. What's going on with this person? Who is this person? How does how does that person affect this person? And so I knew that to get to make my books work, the World War One books, I had to find the human interest. I mm -hmm. knew the battles and I knew the the history of the regiments, but I wanted to know biographies of the soldiers themselves. And so the main thing was find the families, because all these soldiers, when I started researching, of course, had been dead uh, for a long time. So my wife and I started doing, going through obituaries, doing all sorts, going to uh, uh, historical societies in the towns where these soldiers came from, tracking them down. And lo and behold, I was surprised at how many families had letters, had memories, had stories that were passed down. And that was how I was able to develop a different thing than than you know regular journalism where you usually find the person who is you're writing about or the situation that you're writing about and it's right there in front of you but when you start to do the history and you start to track down the families it becomes a, a totally different way of, of, of gathering the information 
Mm. And I know before we before we went live, we were talking about the almost the the lack of general knowledge, historically general knowledge of World War One as compared to say World War Two. Um, do you? I'd be curious as well. Was there a lot of push for, to have the historical knowledge of of as it was called the Great War right after the right after the Great War and before? world war ii started there was a span of there was a span of about 20 well 15 plus years in between those there was there, it, were, there were a lot of good books that came out of that at that time hmm. and one of them of course was all quiet on the western front which is considered you know one of the great war books ever it's a novel ever written and it was written by a, a soldier who had participated in the war and there was a lot of uh, uh, it was so much interest in the war and then all of a sudden it, people just got tired of you know hearing about the war and it just kind of dropped off and then all of a sudden bingo we're in world war ii and uh, then the same thing happened but the interest in world war ii has lasted and is still strong all these you know all these years later Right. And do, do you th do you believe part of it could be the fact there was such a definitive, quote unquote, villain that people can kind of point to for World War Two that would might have been lacking in in World War One? Um, that that's a good another good question. Yes, I mean Hitler was the villain, and right. Germany you know, had, had just invaded uh, Poland and. Uh, what was happening in the Holocaust and uh, people were just, that was a true, true villain. That was, that was a monster. Right. World War One, you did have Germany as a villain, of course, because, you know, the Americans, the allies, and the big villain there was the Kaiser. Mm. And there's a lot of political cartoons of the Kaiser that made it all pretty funny. And one of them has Teddy Roosevelt, you know, pounding his head in and stuff like that <laughs> in the newspapers. But he, but he wasn't a monster villain. He was just the villain. And one of the things that, you know, that started the war was the U-boats, the uh, uh, sinking of merchant ships, passenger ships, and then, of course, the sinking of the Lusitania that killed that killed over 1,000 people, including almost 200 Americans. And that almost started the war. And then a uh, little time passed, and then another thing happened, and then the war started. So how did, how did journalism prepare you to research to make these historical biographies? Well, there were two things. Uh, number one, when, you, when you're a journalist, you learn how to do investigations and how to ask the right questions and, and, and know the right places to go. And that was the foundation. Um, and so it was just a stepping stone to uh, start doing the research, you know, for these books. So I, I did have that investigative training and, that I, and experience that I'd learned in all the years that, uh, you know, I was a journalist. Mm. Um, and you did, as we did mention earlier, you you put out about four books about World War Run, correct? I did. My you have it posted there. That was my first book. And what happened was, I was uh, my great uncle Rayburn Van Buren. He was in the Seventh Regiment. I happened to have his bayonet, and I happened to have his helmet. But uh, I never talked too much about him about the war. I was always talking to him about his cartooning and his magazine illustration career in New York. And, and uh, when he died, I was up in my mother's uh, attic and I found this box and it was filled with letters that he had written from the rest Western Front to his mother, my great, my great grandmother. And I started reading the letters. I couldn't put them down. He was a great writer. He had cartoons. He drew cart, uh, drew, uh, scribbled cartoons on the letters that he wrote home. And uh, as I read them, I said, this is a book. And I didn't know anything about World War I, so I had to research World War I. I had to go down to the National Archives uh, in, in Maryland to get all the research and put it all together. And then I started tracking down uh, a lot of the families of, of the soldiers who were in the regiment to get their stories. And uh, all of a sudden I had a story and I wrote the book and it just, mm. it just worked out that well. And, 
And as I told you earlier, there was an experience at Camp Wadsworth in South Carolina when the 7th Regiment, which was made up of all the rich guys from the up, Upper East Side of New York, were down training uh, with the New York Division. And while they were down there, uh, the War Department sent uh, the regiment from Harlem, all these black soldiers down south in 1917, which was, mm -hmm. uh, I thought, a bonehead decision by the War Department. Why would you send black soldiers down from New York down to right. South Carolina? And uh, there's going to be a race riot. And there almost right. was, and they sent the, the Harlem Hellfighters, before they were named the Hellfighters, to, uh, back to, to France without training, to be out of harm's way, oddly enough. And as they were leaving Camp Wadsworth, they had to march through a gauntlet of white soldiers made up of their brethren, white brethren from New York City, the 7th Regiment. And as they marched through with their rifles on their shoulders, the 7th Regiment the soldiers sang to them George M. Cohan's stirring song, Over There. And I said, wow. I've got to write a story about the Hellfighters. And I did. Wow. And he didn't stop there. You know, I didn't stop there. <laughs> I said, okay, I've done, you know, the white guy, the rich white guys, the, you know, the uh, hardworking black guys, and now I'm going to do the Irish. So I went and I did the book on uh, Father Francis Duffy, whose statue graces Times Square to this day, probably the most beloved and famous priest in American history. Uh, and I started doing that, and I researched, and I wrote a, a Duffy's War. And um, it's interesting, you know, talk about research. I was, I had read on my research that a guy by the name of Richard O'Neill, uh, he was from Harlem, a professional boxer, and he won the Congressional Medal of Honor and he, for, the, for the fighting Irish. And he uh, kept a war diary. And boy, did I want that war diary. And I said, I got to find that war diary. And I got the, his obituary. And in obituaries, they always say who the survivors are. And then they say where their survivors lived. And then I contact the survivors if I can. But there was no survivors listed. So right. I went on Ancestry.com. And I said, I'm writing a book on uh, the fighting 69th. And I want to know about uh, Sergeant Richard O'Neill, who had a war diary and won the Congressional Medal of Honor. Well, I posted it. I'm doing all this research. A year goes by. And all of a sudden, I get an email from Dublin, Ireland. And a guy said, I just wrote a book on the O'Neills, and I got a nasty phone call from a guy in Michigan. He said, you never put my father in there, and he won the Congressional Medal of Honor fighting for the Fighting 69th. And boy, I, boy, I got all excited. And so I looked, called him up, and I said, well, who I was? I said, Are, is this Richard O'Neill's uh, son? He said, yeah, I'm William Donovan O'Neill. Well, William O'Donovan is the guy that founded the CIA, and he was in the 69th. And I said, oh, he's the right guy. And I said, do you have uh, your father's war diary? He said, I do. I'll send it to you. And he sent me the diary. Never had it insured. Just sent it to me. Oh, wow. And I had the war diary. Of course, I sent it back to him. And then I chatted with him, and he gave me all sorts of information about his father, about Father Duffy. And, and that was kind of neat. It's just interesting how those things fall into place. And then you wrote your your fourth book, the Rock of Rock well, of the Mars. Mars. Yeah, that was the third division. The third division, they they're called the Rock of the Marne because they were on the Marne River, and the Germans were going to do their last final assault. And if they could go to over the Rhine, over the Marne River, they might win the war. So. They, they took the strongest point, was the Rock of the Marne with the third division, and they stopped the Germans from crossing the river, and they earned that uh, title, the Rock of the Marne. And in World War II, one of the soldiers of the third division was probably the most, most decorated soldier in American history, Audie Murphy. And uh, he went on to become a movie actor. But uh, Audie Murphy was a, a, a soldier in the Rock of the Marne. And uh, so I did that. And then I didn't know what else to do. So I went, what else do I want to write? <laughs> and all of a sudden, I decided I'd write a book inspired by my son, Mark, mm -hmm. who was 
a great decathlete in high school and college. And uh, he's a na native Vermonter. And so uh, I sat down and wrote a novel, and I, a young adult novel. Fiction is totally different than nonfiction, of course. Uh, and I sat there and I, I wrote it, but I had, I had a lot of inspiration beside my son. One of my heroes when I was growing up was Bob Mathias. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if a lot of people know who Bob Mathias is today, but he, he won the decathlon in uh, 1948, 1952. That's correct. He was the youngest. Uh, he still is to this day the youngest uh, Olympic gold uh, gold medalist in track and field. And uh, I had a chance to interview him and meet him personally when I was writing my my first book, 100 Golden Olympians. And uh, so I had to interview all these 100 Golden Olympians. So I interviewed him. And one of the other ones that I interviewed was Bill Toomey, who won the gold medal in 1968. And Bill Toomey and I became good friends. And uh, he taught, tell me stories about, you know, good decathletes come from small towns. They come from the country because in high school, there's not a lot of students, a lot of athletes. So they got to play track. They got to do football. They got to play basketball, baseball, do all these things. So they're very good at all these events. I said, oh, that makes sense. And so I started thinking about this young boy up in the wilds of the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, living in the mountains, you know, running around, jumping boulders and doing all this stuff. And then all of a sudden he comes down and he's got all this natural ability to do these events, but he never did them. He doesn't know anything about track and field, but then he meets another guy, a, a wounded vet, a Vietnam veteran, who is trying to get his life back together and comes to Vermont and stays at his house, living in the barn, and he teaches the hero, his name is Skeets, how to hurdle, how to pole vault. <laughs> He's a natural because that's what he did, you know, jumping over rocks and everything in, in, up in the mountains. And so then he does this and he goes down to New York City to uh, the Eastern High School States uh, Track Championship, which is really exists at Randall's Island in, in, in Manhattan. And my son competed there. I saw uh, Dan O'Brien compete there. And it, it, so I, I put that the setting is where they do their decathlon and how and what happens, whether he wins it or not. It's another story. Right. Yeah. And then you mentioned too, like no, the, the term, no excuses. Okay. The term, no excuses. Another person that I interviewed in my book, 100 Golden Olympians was Glenn Davis. And Glenn Davis in 1956, 1960, won three gold medals. He was the world uh, record holder in the intermediate or the 400 meter hurdles. And he won both gold medals, setting world records. And he also anchored the four, four by 400 relay, uh, winning his third gold medal. But Glenn Davis was the son of a coal miner in, in, West, in West Virginia. And when he was 16 years old, his father was dying of lung cancer and still smoking cigarettes. And he took, he went to the hospital to see him just before he died. And with him was his mother. And they sat, they, they sat by the bed until Glenn Davis's father died. And then there was a lot of sadness, of course. And they got in the car. Glenn was driving. And his mother dropped out of a heart attack in his lap. They were driving. And he was so angry. He was an orphan. He just, he just would go and beat people up. He wouldn't do anything. He wouldn't go to school. And, uh, but he was, he, he, before that happened, he was, he was on the high school football team. And he was so good that uh, Woody Hayes, who was then was a coach at Ohio State, came down to see him. Hmm. And he, oh, he was only a sophomore in high school. He said, I can't talk to you. I'll see you in two years. And then Davis's parents died. And he went to Barberton, Ohio, just out of a, south of Akron. And there he started to take up track and football. And he played basketball. He did out. He did everything. He won the state uh, track championship for his team just by himself. And uh, Woody Hayes came down and said, "I want you to come to Ohio State and play football." And he was still an angry young man, still angry. Mm -hmm. But he had a motto, and that motto was "No excuses." And he's not going to let any excuse get in the way of, of doing what he wants to do. 
and he went to Ohio State to play football. And Woody Hayes saw how fast he was, and he said, no, I'm going to turn you over to the track coach, who coached Jesse Owens, who won the, the, the you know, four gold medals in 1936. And then from there, uh, Glenn Davis went on to become, uh, you know, the fastest human. He even played football for the Detroit Lions, who were playing catch it in Ohio State Stadium. Uh, and uh, uh, Howard Hopalong Cassidy, who won uh, the Heisman uh, Trophy, playing for the Lions, said, Come on out and try out for the Lions. He did. He made it. Uh, and he only played a couple of years and then he, he uh, quit. But uh, had no excuses. That motto that he had carried him through, got him past all the hard times. And uh, that's why I use that as the title for the book, because the two protagonists in the book have to overcome certain things. And they decide, and, and the, the, the uh, Vietnam veteran, he's a wounded Vietnam veteran. Uh, he's the fellow in the wheelchair. Uh, he, uh, was he knew Glenn Davis? This is all fiction, but in my book, he knows Glenn Davis, and the Glenn Davis came to, comes to the hospital where uh, our, our hero is, is is back from getting shot down. He was a helicopter pilot, and uh, tells him about no excuses. You can't have excuses. You're going to get over this, and he carries a poster that uh, uh, Glenn Davis of Glenn Davis hurtling, and it says no excuses on the top. And, uh, uh, and so he uses that and he tells uh, Skeets, you know, you could be a decathlete. You, he's a shy boy. He's, he's, he's a, he doesn't think he can fit in with the other kids at school. And he says, you can, there are no excuses. And that right. theme that follows through the book. Right. Now, so, so talk to us a bit about, you mentioned earlier that writing fiction is different than writing biography. Um, what were some of the opportunities and, and challenges that you faced writing a writing a fiction book? Well, the one thing about writing uh, fiction is your characters have to be believable. Mm. You can you can't say that that, that guy that doesn't come he doesn't ring true. They've got they've got to ring true, and so when you're writing it, make sure the the character the characterizations the things that this uh, person will do are not off the wall something that would, would, would make any sense if you follow his character his character's got to be true all the way through i mean it can change but you know in a lot of books change this is the no excuses that's what happened to skeets he changes Right. But to say that that, that that part of him is always true, that one thing that that, that that string that follows him is always true. And and that's what and the other thing is if you're going to write about an animal, make sure that what you write about that animal is true. You can't have a you know a five-legged possum out there, you know, you know, running laps. You got you gotta make sure it's sleeping in the road. But yeah. uh, <laughs> yeah, but you got to have those kind of things, and you got to make sure that in Vermont you have the Green Mountains. Okay, they're not that tall, but they're they're, they're magnificent. But you can't put the Rockies. You know, can't say they're you know they're fifteen thousand feet high. You can't right. do that. You got to have everything's got to be true, but everything else can be made up. Right. You know the uh, the plot line, of course, is is, is all made up. Mm. Did you find it easier to write? No excuses as compared to your World War One biographies. It's never easy to write. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's uh, the the one thing that was probably easier is I didn't have to do a lot of research. Right. But I guess over time, I had been researching no excuses because I'd always been interested in the decathlon, and eventually I wanted to write a book on the history of the Olympic decathlon. Mm. And I started researching the decathlon, and that's how I became friends with uh, Bill Toomey. Uh, and uh, he and I became friends. And actually, we grew, we grew up in the same uh, in Fairfield County, Connecticut. He grew up in New Canaan. I grew up in Norwalk, two towns that abutted each other. He's a couple of years older than I am, but we never knew each other. Uh, but now we do. And uh, I was just, just talking to him about the decathlon and how he would say that uh, good decathletes come from small towns. Uh, look at Bruce Jenner. 
uh, Caitlyn Jenner, Bruce Jenner came from uh, Newtown, Connecticut, his Sandy Hook, actually. That's a very small town. And uh, Bob Mathias came from uh, San Joaquin Valley in a small town, Tulare. That's a small town. So a lot of these guys came from small towns. And very few of them come from, you know, big cities because in a big city, you go to a big high school, you're only going to play one sport probably because there's too many other people playing sports. That's his theory. I bought it. My son came from, he grew up in Westport, which is a suburban town of just outside New York City, but it's a small town. And he played track and he pole vaulted. He played basketball. He did the decathlon in high school. And then uh, he went to George Mason to be on a track athlete. He was down there for two years and he dropped out and he was building houses, which is what he really loves to do. And one day a guy named Rob Musio came by and said, I want to make the U.S. Olympic team. Will you train with me? And Rob Musio had been the two-time NCAA Division I decathlon champion at George Mason. And so my son trained with him. Mm. And I, at Randall's Island in New York, they had a chance to make the U.S. team that was going to go to the World Games in, I think it was Japan. And Dan O'Brien was there. Dave Johnson was there. Both guys were going to go on to win medals. And, and there was a whole bunch of other guys that were, you know, obviously were competing. Rob Musio made the team. Huh. That inspired my son. And then Rob Musio made the U.S. Olympic team and finished sixth, which was yeah. great. And my son came back home and he said, Dad, I'm going back to school. I want to make the uh, U.S. Olympic decathlon team. Mm -hmm. And college, he won the internet, the New England Intercollegiate Decathlon Championship at Dartmouth. And then he got injured and wow. in his career. But he now coaches. I mean, he, he, he's, he's building. He loves to build stuff. So he's, he's in construction. But he coaches. He comes in Middlebury, where he lives. He coaches at the Middlebury College and at the high school. He teaches the kids how to do pole vault. And that was his record. He was, you know, a three-time New England pole vault high school champion. Right. It, it, and it seems as though, like, your book, No Excuses, seems to have combined three of your – favorite things almost is one is the decathlon one is being the olympic piece one is having a vietnam vet in there and you've read about wrote about war stories and you put it under the backdrop of 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 vermont which as you mentioned earlier has a lot of family history uh with you with with, with yourself and your son now was this were you deliberate in adding these three ingredients into a book or was this something that happened as you were writing that's no, I, you know, I don't know if I thought of it that way. I just needed, to, I, I wanted the kid, you know, to do the thing, but how am I going to get him to, to uh, uh, learn these events, being shy and not going out for any of the, of the teams in high school? And then all of a sudden I said, I'm going to bring in a, a, a Vietnam veteran, but he's got to be wounded. Hmm. Uh, so he's got to have a reason why he's there. So I, I put him there, and I so I developed his story. So I developed both stories, and I have a few other people of their stories and built, developed, including a girl. You got to have a girl. You got to have that romance, you know. That uh, kind of there. So I brought her in, and that worked out. And uh, it took me a while to develop her because I come from a family. I have four sisters, so I and I two grandmothers and my mother. We all they all lived in the same house at the same time, <laughs> and I was like the lonesome guy. I think I did a pretty good job with her, try, trying to develop her character, you know, from a guy's point of view. Right. And that may have been the hardest thing. Right. And, and and I think you said in a previous interview, too, is that the, the main characters are almost seem to be like an amalgamation of um, Bob Mathias, mm -hmm. uh, uh, your son, Mark, and also Glenn Davis. Is that correct? You're correct. Yes. Yes. They're all three of them. I, I, I could see, you know, Glenn Davis, a guy that had to overcome so much uh, uh, sadness in his life that made him so angry. And in that way, he was a handicapped guy. And then, of course, uh, you know, Bob Mathias, you know, being so young and trying to, you know, he, when he competed in 1948, he competed against World War II veterans. Mm. And uh, they were mad. They wanted to win because they, they couldn't compete in 1940. They couldn't compete in 1944. 
Right. So 48 was their chance, and they really wanted to compete and win. And here comes this little bratty kid from California, 17 years old, and he blows them out. Just It was just so great to, to, to interview Bob Mathias, to hear his story and how he won in 52. And he could have won in 56, except back in the day, you couldn't make money off of your fame as an Olympian. And he started in, a mo in his movie, The Bob Mathias Story, in 1954, I think it was. That took care of him. He could have won three in a row. He didn't. And that's, I, that movie was what made me, when I was a little kid, when I saw I was a teenager, when I saw that movie, that made me a big, he was my hero. Now, let, to talk to us a bit about your your process. Now, when, when you first wrote your first World War One book, that was back in the early 2000s. So you have about 20 years, a little, almost 20 years of experience, and you've written five books so far. How is your process different from your first book to this book? Uh, it hasn't changed at all. I think, okay. I think you have to get into a rhythm. Mm. And that means you've got to get up, you do little things that you do, but you got these habits that you do. I have to do three crossword puzzles. And in the morning. So I do three crossword puzzles. Then I read just a little bit to get my brain going. And then I sit down and I write. And I try to write, you know, 100 to three to 400 words a day, depending on how the day is going. And uh, then, then, then I will think about it. And even sometimes I can't sleep at night because I'm thinking about what I wrote. And I'm thinking about what I'm going to write. And how am I going to write it? And then I come down and then I rewrite. I sit there and I rewrite. I'm just a terrible rewriter or a good rewriter. I don't know, but I rewrite a, a lot. And then I get it. And it has to be on a clean sheet of paper. Mm. I can't have any okay. colors. Thank goodness for the uh, computer because I can do it and print it out and I have my page. And then if I make an, uh, I'm, I'm terrible. I probably kill a thousand trees, but that's what, that's what I do. And I get it going. And then eventually at the end of the year, I've got 300 pages, you know, 350 pages. It's done. Wow. And it's amazing. And when I was writing Duffy's War, I had a next door neighbor. And after work, he was a lawyer. And after work, he'd come over to the house for a glass of wine. He, he was a good Irish bachelor and he would come over for a glass of wine. He'd walk into the house you know, at six or seven o'clock at night. And he'd say, the first thing he'd say to me, did you amount to anything today? And I'd have to say, yeah, I wrote 200 words. Is that good? <laughs> and that's that's the way it was. And that's that's how it is. I have to write. If I don't write, if I, I miss a day, I don't write on Sundays. But if I miss a day, it's like, oh, my goodness, what am I going to do? I got to make that up. But I got to keep right. writing. And that's when I start writing. Before that, when I then I have to do the research, too. If I'm doing you know, like a nonfiction book, you know, sometimes it'll take a year, year and a half to do the research. And then I spend you know, all, all the time I'm doing the research. I'm, you know, like the, the, the plot, the way I'm going to write it is, is, you know, pounding inside my skull. So, Steve, how important is an editor for an author when it comes to that? Exceedingly important. I've had two good editors. Uh, well, I'll mention one of them, Don McKeon. Uh, he, was, he, he was my editor for my first three books. Um. Uh, and he was at Potomac Books, and he would write little things. He he he, he, <laughs> he was a wise guy. He he would make little snide remarks in the columns sometimes, and, and get me I get me mad. And I <laughs> him up and say, I'm just kidding, but you got to understand what I why I made that change because they you think you've got it all, right? But you don't. And an editor is, you know, he's there to make sure everything comes out. He's, he's like, you know, you're a dirty pair of pants on the ironing board. He's the iron. <laughs> and he does that. So that's that. You've got to have a good editor. And in my book on uh, uh, Rock of the Marn, I had a good editor at, at Penguin Random House. And she was terrific. And then she vanished. Hmm. Nobody knows where she went. Huh. And, uh, I always wanted to thank her and whatever it was, but she was gone, but she was a good editor. Um, and my uh, no excuses, 
I had a good editor at, at, at Rootstock uh, Publishing. And I was very fortunate to have a good editor there, there as well. Um, when I wrote 100 Golden Olympians for the U.S. Olympic Committee, I was not only the writer, I was my own editor. And, okay. But uh, I, I, my wife is a terrific proofreader. She's great. She reads everything. And uh, she doesn't write snide remarks on the, on the column. She whacks me on the side of the head. <laughs> what do you mean to say that? <laughs> no, she, she, she was good. And, so so, how, how, so you, you did mention that you rewrite a lot of things. Yeah. How that process where you start out, you start off being your own editor. Do you see that as doing the work of an editor and you're able to, you know, uh, self delete certain parts of it? Or do you feel as though that actually hinders the work of an editor? Cause you might've taken some things out that an editor might have, might have suggested leaving in. Well, the editor will not see the, 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 the I only send them the finished product. Right. So they don't see all my changes that, you know, that I edit through. I just, I will read one page over maybe three or four times and keep making mm -hmm. changes until I feel like I'm, I've got it where I want. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if I write a chapter or I write an, an article or a short story, I always give it to my wife and she reads it. And she said, did you mean to say that? And you got this, you, you, you're missing a word there, something like that. She always makes sure that everything is good before it's sent out. She does right. it. This, it came out through Rootstock Publishing. Yes. Um, how, how did you find Rootstock Publishing to do your, do your publishing for? Well, it's, it's interesting because uh, my, uh, well, the first, the first publisher was uh, for 100 Golden Olympians. Uh, was the U.S. Olympic Committee, mm. and that was a one-time deal. And then uh, when I started doing, I didn't have an agent. When I started writing my war books, my first three, uh, I, I went through a Writer's Digest looking for a publisher, and I came across it was called, but then it was called Brassies, and they were like one, one of the top military publishers in the world. So I sent them a, a, a query and, and a couple of chapters. And they accepted it, and they paid me an upfront fee of two thousand dollars. And then they did my next book and my third book. And then I they 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 got sold to uh, University of Nebraska Press. Hmm. And I decided I'm going to try something else. So I got an agent, and my agent and I I sent him about the bar uh, the, the mar rock of the mark because when I was in the army. I remember I would go into uh, the sergeant's office and they always had a poster, Rock of the Marn. And I always went, what the heck is a Rock of the Marn? And so I decided to check out the Rock of the Marn, I found out. So my agent got um, Berkeley Caliber, which is an imprint of uh, Penguin Random House. Hmm. They were my publisher. And the, I told you the editor was good. She disappeared. So they did no publicity for the book at all. Nothing. Mm. So I was a little mad. You know, I did all this work and they never got me any uh, uh, going to Walmart or going to uh, Barnes and Noble and talk. The other, the other book, the other publisher did that. So I said, I'm going to self publish. Right. So I thought about self publishing and I said, no, I don't want to do that. So my wife's reading, we're, 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 and she always reads the Middlebury Addison Independent because this is where we were and she loved it. He said, look at this guy just won an award for a young adult novel from Rootstock, Rootstock Publishing in Montpelier, Vermont. I said, oh. So, because my book was, you know, out in Vermont. So I contacted them. And what they are is they're, they're called a hybrid publisher. It's a mm -hmm. cross between traditional publishing and, and independent publishing, self-publishing. And you give the money up front and they'll, they do all the work. Mm -hmm. And it's great, but you're right there all the way. Right. And they'll tell you this, we're going to do this. They send you the edit, the edits. Is this okay? Does this work? But they make sure everything's good. They have a great proofreader, uh, a copy editor, uh, a, a regular editor. And now they have a, a terrific marketing gal who's, who's doing all the marketing. I'm very, very impressed with them. And I tell you, so Steve, if people... Uh, if people want to learn more about your books, they can go to, you have a website, stephenlharris.com. Would that be the best place that people could go to? That's correct. 
that's it. And if they want to leave a message, I'll, I will answer the message. Yeah. Okay. And, and as, and as we talked about, you do have, and all of your books, all the books that we were just talking about are available to look at right up here as well. Um, all four of your world war one books and plus no excuses is right there at the top. And the one that just came out a couple months ago. Right. That's right. And there's other, there's a few other things. There are some, uh, articles that I, that I've written that are in, that are on my website as well as a, uh, uh, a movie treatment that I did. Well, many, 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 many years ago, but I couldn't find any interest in it. But right now I think it might be good. It's, uh, it's called the rainbow kid. It's about, rainbow kid right here. Yep. Yeah. It's about a little, it's about a superhero who is a uh, Mexican American and uh, he's go he's being smuggled across the border. Wow. Now, this was a long time ago, and uh, uh, he gets in trouble with the the, the the traffickers, human traffickers, and they throw him out in the middle of the desert because he saw a rainbow, and they say, "Yeah, go find that rainbow, kid." And so <laughs> he's in the desert all by himself, and he crawls to the rainbow, and he finds the end of the rainbow, and he wow. goes down inside the rainbow. And he becomes a superhero. The rainbow. That's nice. <laughs> but he rides, that's motor nice. he rides motocross bikes. That's his. That's his. He doesn't ride horses or fly, but he has a motorbike, and he shoots all over <laughs> the desert. That's cool. And then you're also, and as 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 you mentioned too, that no excuses can be found also at the rootstockpublishing.com as well. Yeah, so. Rootstock, and it's on Amazon. It's uh, Barnes and Noble. It, it should be in a for, the, for those in Vermont. It should be in a lot of Vermont bookstores. Right. Perfect. All right. Well, listen. So thanks a lot for coming on, Steve. And as you mentioned, you do a lot of writing. So the next time you have a book, come back on. I'd love to chat with you more. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it so much, Barney. Wow. Oh, you yeah, the book cover. I was talking. I was talking about the picture behind you on your room. Oh. Oh, oh. In your room behind you, yeah. Is that? Oh, that's a uh, photograph. Yeah, oh, that's, that's Middlebury. That's uh, Middlebury. Okay, all right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we, we just moved into this house, so <laughs> I'm not used to anything. And that picture was hanging on the wall, so we left it there. Okay, all right. It, it came with the house, huh? Yeah, yeah. It came with the house. Yeah. <laughs>